Hi guys, this is Dr. Momsilovich's Bio 182, Lecture 5.1 on Prokaryotes. You guys should have covered most of this material in Bio 181. We're just doing a quick review in case you don't remember this. It's been a while, but if this is unfamiliar, this is something that you guys should um, look a little bit more deeply into. We're just going to do a pretty brief overview of prokaryotes. So the first thing is the characteristics of prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells have circular DNA, which is located in the center of the cell in an area called the nucleoid. Prokaryotic cells do not have a membrane enclosed nucleus. They also have free floating ribosomes floating around in their cytoplasm, as well as a capsule and a cell wall that is made of an outer membrane, peptidoglycan layer, and plasma membrane. Prokaryotes also have a flagellum, which allows them to move around and find areas that have good amounts of food. So where are prokaryotes found? They are found pretty much everywhere. They can be free living, um, so you would just find them on the surfaces of leaves or fruit. Um, you find them in the soil. You find them all over. Prokaryotes can also be parasitic, so they live inside of other organisms or inside the cells of other organisms. And they can appear as what we call a biofilm. So this is a community of microorganisms that adhere to a surface. So when you think about when you wake up in the morning or after after your long day at school and you have sort of a film on your teeth, that is a, a community of several different species of bacteria that are um, that have created a livable environment on your teeth. So just an interesting fact about bacterial cells within your body, there are about 10 times the number of bacterial cells as the number of human cells in your body. So we often think that we are clean people and in reality, our skin is covered in bacteria at all times. Some of them are good for us. We have bacteria in our guts, which are good for us. We have bacteria everywhere, and there's more bacteria in your body than there are your own body cells. One of the reasons that prokaryotes have been so successful is that they have cell walls, and those cell walls protect the bacterial cells from things outside of the cell. There are two distinct types of cell walls in bacteria. The first has a thick layer of peptidoglycan on the outside with a thin, a thinner layer of plasma membrane inside of that peptidoglycan layer. The second type of bacteria have an outer membrane, a, 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 an outer membrane followed by a thin layer of peptidoglycan and then a plasma membrane inside of that. And that becomes important when we're talking about ways that we can treat different um, illnesses, bacterial infections, um, with antibiotics and things like that. And because of those layers, bacteria are either labeled as gram-positive or gram-negative. The bacteria that are gram-positive, when, when they're stained with um, crystal violet stain, because they have that really thick peptidoglycan layer, that absorbs a lot of that crystal violet stain and it turns the color of the bacterial cells purple. The gram-negative bacteria have a very thin layer of that peptidoglycan and so less of the molecules are absorbed and those bacteria end up turning sort of a pinkish red color instead of the purple. And so we can use that test to determine whether each bacteria is gram positive or gram negative, and that tells us about the type of structures that they have outside of their cells. 
Another reason that prokaryotes are so successful is because they are able to move. Um, they use their flagella to move into areas that have more food or better conditions for their survival. They use their flagella um, and sort of whip it around in a propeller-like motion, um, and they can do that in either a clockwise or a counterclockwise motion to change their direction and allow them to move. Eukaryotes can also have flagella, but they also can have cilia, um, and those are undulopodia, which we also call swinging feet. And the difference would be that the eukaryotes have a, a 9 plus 2 oxoneme um, structure, which is centered around centrioles in the center of it. Prokaryotes have two basic types of movement. The first one is called taxis, which is movement toward or away from a chemical signal. And the other is called quorum sensing. This is where you have, it can be movement and also cell-cell communication, like what we see when certain types of bacteria use bioluminescence and they communicate with the other cells around them um, to be able to make that bioluminescence occur in all of the bacteria simultaneously. Prokaryotes are also very successful because they have several different ways that they are able to reproduce. And some of those ways of reproduction can happen very quickly. So the first type of reproduction that a prokaryote can do is called binary fission, which is essentially where the cell's circular DNA is copied and the cell just doubles itself and makes a second copy of it and makes a new daughter cell from the parent cell. And that can happen very, very quickly. While that DNA is getting um, copied, the mutation rate is incredibly high. And so that is why we see such a, a, a high mutation rate in bacteria, because when they reproduce in this way, they're not using the same checks as eukaryotes to ensure that their DNA is being copied correctly. Prokaryotes can also uptake DNA from their environment. This is called transformation. They can use phages to carry DNA from one bacteria to another, and that's the process called transduction. The last one is called conjugation, which is where we have a transfer of DNA between a donor and a recipient bacteria often using plasmids, which are circular strands of DNA that bacteria can pick up. So when we think about diversity and we think about reproduction, the only way in eukaryotes that we get genetic diversity is through meiosis, where we split the DNA of a male or a female into um, sperm and eggs and then recombine that genetic information. But in prokaryotes, they can get more, um, more diversity in their DNA through um, binary fission because there's quite a bit of mutation going on. But the main ways that they're able to get new um, DNA is through the other three types of, um, of uh, getting genetic diversity. So transformation, transduction, and conjugation are ways to get new DNA and new genes into that cell. Prokaryotes also have very diverse types of metabolism. They can use light, inorganic, or organic substances for energy sources. The first type of prokaryote is called photoautotrophs which use light and carbon dioxide similar to plants to create their energy. The second is photoheterotrophs, which use light and organic compounds to create energy. Chemolithotrophs, which use inorganic substances um, such as rock, essentially. Litho is rock, and so they're actually consuming pieces of rock to create their energy, and they use that as well as carbon dioxide, and chemoheterotrophs, which use organic substances and organic compounds to create their energy. And so because of this, 
prokaryotes are able to survive in many different environments as well as use a variety of different resources for survival. So if you think back, we talked about the fact that there are three domains of life. There are eukarya, archaea, and bacteria. Within the domain of bacteria, we're going to talk about a five different specific examples of types of bacteria and um, the groups within them. So within the domain bacteria, one type of prokaryote is called proteobacteria. These are gram negative, so they have a very thin layer of um, peptidoglycan. They're often called purple bacteria, and they have many modes of nutrition. So the example we have here is called rhizobium which are nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in the root nodules of legumes. Legumes are peas and beans, those types of plants, and in their roots they have little nodules that are just um, naturally there, and so the rhizobium bacteria live in those nodules and they have a symbiotic relationship with the legume plants where um, the plant is supplying the rhizobium with a sort of a shelter and a safe place to live, as well as some of the um, some of the um, plant sugars that they create. And in return, the rhizobium, so the um, the bacteria, are able to fix nitrogen in the soil, which the plant cannot do, and change it into a form that the plant can take up and use for its own. Um, uh, for its own self. The second type of bacteria that we're going to talk about are the chlamydias. These are the smallest types of bacteria and they only live as parasites in other cells. One of, um, one of the well-known examples of this is called blinding trachoma and this is common in, um, in Africa as well as other tropical areas around the world. And it is the leading cause of blindness in children in those areas. The other type of chlamydia that we're going to talk about is the one that most of you have probably heard of, which is the sexually transmitted type of chlamydia. And it is very prevalent around the world. In the United States, about 1.6 million cases were reported in 2016. And um, there are estimates that if, um, if you include unreported cases, there would actually be about 2.9 million each year. So it affects around 2% of young people in, in the world. And so it is something to be mindful of if you are a young single person. Next um, type of bacteria we're going to talk about are the spirochetes. These are also gram negative and they move using axial filaments. The one we're gonna talk about a little bit more in detail is Borrelia burgdorferi. And this is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So in Arizona, Lyme disease is not much of a concern because of how Lyme disease is spread. So Lyme disease is spread by ticks that usually feed on um, deer and rabbits and things like that in their natural ecosystem. But if there are a lot of ticks and not enough of those mammals to go around and there's a human in the area, the ticks will attach to a human and during that they can um, release the bacteria from their own body into the human that they're having a blood meal from. Um, and this is much more common in the eastern United States. If you look at the map on the slide, um, New York, Connecticut, um, Pennsylvania, all of those types of states, as well as somewhat in um, the Midwest, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana. Um, I have been bitten by several ticks. I'm from northwest Indiana, just south of Lake Michigan. So that section of Indiana that's the brighter pink color 
And when I was doing my master's degree, I did a lot of field research in Wisconsin, which Wisconsin has very high rates of um, Lyme disease and ticks. Um, and so we spent a lot of time pulling ticks off of each other during that, which was wonderful. The next type of bacteria that we're going to discuss is called cyanobacteria. Um, sometimes this is called blue-green algae, but algae is actually a term for eukaryotic photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms, and so this should realistically and correctly be called cyanobacteria. This is what we think is responsible for the production of oxygen on early Earth. We, we think or we know that early Earth had a very anoxic um, environment and once cyanobacteria evolved and started doing photosynthesis and releasing oxygen, that was when we started having more oxygen accumulate in the atmosphere. Um, they use chlorophyll, um, chlorophyll A for photosynthesis and we think that an ancestral bacteria is what led to the formation of the chloroplasts in plants. And we will talk a little bit more about that process of um, endosymbiosis that led to that um, in a future lecture. So the next group of bacteria that we're going to talk about are gram-positive bacteria. And there are either high CG gram-positive or low CG gram-positive. High CG means that they have a, um, a high amount of guanine and cytosine in their DNA um, compared to um, adenine and thymine. And so most of these um, are, are free living in the soil and some of them can cause disease. So one, um, one type in particular is called mycobacterium tuberculosis and that causes human tuberculosis or TB in humans, which kills about 3 million people each year. The second type of gram-positive bacteria are low GC gram-positive bacteria. These bacteria produce endospores, which are hard heat-resistant capsules. One example is Bacillus thuringiensis, which are a bacteria that kill caterpillars and they're actually used as a pesticide on organic produce to kill, um, to kill caterpillars on things such as cabbage. And so if you are an avid organic food eater, a uh, there's a good chance that some of your leafy greens have been treated with, um, with this type of um, bacteria to control the amount of caterpillars that are consuming that crop. Okay, so we've talked about bacteria. We also need to discuss briefly the domain archaea. Within archaea, there are several different um, there are several different types of archaea again, and we're going to talk about these four. The first one are Eurearchaea um, or Eurocaeota, which are the methanogens. So one third of the atmospheric methane, which is a greenhouse gas, is created as a byproduct of archaean metabolism. So this type of archaea actually creates methane during its metabolism. So there are um, bacteria that live in the guts of ruminants, which are cows and sheep. And so having large numbers of those types of animals on the planet is an issue because when they belch or fart, they're releasing methane from um, these uh, bacteria that live in their stomachs, and that methane is released into the air. Um, ruminants are not able to actually digest plant material on their own. They swallow it, and then these, um, uh, these archaea that live in their stomach are able to digest it, and so they have a symbiotic relationship between the ruminant, which is the cow or the sheep, and these archaea, and so the archaea are able to digest that plant material for the, um, for the animal because they can't do it on their own. Their stomachs are not capable of it. Another um, example is in termites, and 
um, there are bacteria that live in the gut of protozoans and the protozoans live inside the guts of termites um, and those bacteria are methanogens. And so they help the termites break down wood that they're eating because the termites are unable to do that for themselves. So the termite has um, eats wood, the inside of the termite's gut, it has protozoans. The protozoans also can't um, digest that wood material. And so the protozoans consume it, and inside of the protozoans, there are methanogens that consume that wood material. And so it's this sort of chain reaction, almost like Russian dolls, where one is smaller inside of each of the other. The second type of archaea are the crenarchaeota, or the extremophiles. Um, as the name implies, these guys live in extreme environments. Um, thermophiles live in very, very hot environments. Acidophiles live in very acidic environments. Um, and halophiles live in very salty environments. So we would find these for the most part in um, sulfurous geothermal springs and volcanoes, such as in Yellowstone National Park. The third type of archaea is what is known as the nanoarchaeota. And this one only has one known species, which is Nanoarchaeum aquitens. And it was only isolated from a hydrothermal vent in Yellowstone and the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. We, this is the only species in this, um, in this part of the Archaea. And they're very, very rare. There's only one species that we have found so far. The last types of archaea are the Corarchaeota or Xenarchaeota. These are found in hydrothermal spots in both fresh and seawater, but again, we don't know a lot about these guys, and so there's not a lot much else that I can tell you about them.